welcome to Discast Here, a podcast for parents and educators about the best way to support kids living with learning difficulties. Today, we're joined by Dr. Sandra Marshall, who's a GP in South Australia and a passionate advocate for kids and families living with dyslexia. Sandra was the co-founder of Dyslexia SA and is now the chairperson of Code Red Dyslexia Network in Australia. Code Red's all about raising awareness about dyslexia and supporting and empowering people living with dyslexia and their families. Sandra was recently instrumental in achieving the introduction of a year one phonics check for all students in South Australia, which is an amazing achievement and is going to make a huge difference to students living with dyslexia. I'm Michael Shanahan. I'm Bill Hansberry. And can we introduce our special guest, Michael? Yes, please. (laughs) Sandra Marshall. Now, before we go on, Sandra, I'd better acknowledge that we are again on the lands of the Ghana people and pay respects to the fact that they are the traditional custodians of where we are. Yes. Yeah. Here, here. Well, hmm. so, Sandra, we sit here. The, the Sandra, I, I'm, well, I'm kind of a little bit flustered because you're all <laughs> to me, Sandra. We sit in Sandra's back room and we're surrounded by um, the history, I think, that led to where we are today. Um, I'm looking at some northern... Uh, Northern Adelaide local uh, Medicare awards with dag bags on them and some dad some dag bags Pinot Grigio. How do you pronounce that, Sandra? Have I got that right? I'd say that's correct. To my yeah. right, I've got a ton of books. We've got Shay Witz's Overcoming Dyslexia, Visible Learning by Hattie Seidenberg's Language at the Speed of Sight, Neil, McKay, Neil McKay's uh, uh, he, uh, removing dyslexia as a barrier to achievement, and I think, uh, mm. among others, really, really good work. Sandra, what we're surrounded by, even on the wall, is a testament to this has been a long road, and we're having a sip of wine. From, and the and the label is the Wild Ride. Sandra, it's been a wild ride, hasn't it? It has. I'd never thought it would. I would still be advocating um, a decade on from when I began, but. Um, We've come a long way, but there's sadly a long way to go. And I always feel like if you take your foot off the pedal, the journey goes back a step or two, which is why it's so important for more advocates to step up and help because it's it's a hard gig and mm. um, the more that join in, the easier it becomes. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe, Sandra, if you could just maybe give a little bit of an introduction to yourself, how you got into this, mm. what you know, a bit of a, a background of how you got involved. <laughs> Well, um, I guess, um, <laughs> oh, gee, at, at long term, I guess I've, I grew up in the country and I went to five different schools and um, I was only thinking today, I cannot remember the first three years of my schooling because I was struggling, I was failing and I completely blocked that part of my life out. It wasn't until grade four that the teacher rescued me somehow and I, and I started to find success and as you know, success leads to more success. So you probably see my eyes. I'm quite ashamed. I feel ashamed of my earlier schooling. Mm. It, it wells me up. Mm-hmm. And I somehow have managed to put that behind me. Um, you know, I'm good at sciences and maths. So I've um, got into medical school through sheer hard work and um, found it really, really hard going to get through medical school up until – um, fourth year and became more practical and then again I found my my groove so um, and then I went into general practice and I guess I've only heard this recently and I think it's true that being a GP is like doing parent teach interviews every day <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of really intense mm. and you're always worried about connecting with people appropriately and making a difference mm. in that short period of time but um, it gives you a lot of practice at that yeah, so I think that's what sort of set me up for advocacy because you're mm. constantly advocating for patients as a GP, mm. particularly mm. out here in Gawler. And um, and then uh, my uh, husband and I have had two little boys and I was really looking forward to them starting school because I thought finally I can, you know, get back to some meaty work and get my teeth back into medicine because mm. I was very part-time. And then, uh, lo and behold, both our boys struggled and we had done everything to help them, you know, from speech therapy to occupational therapy to tutors. 
And um, when the second one came along, I was I even had all the alphabet around his room as a freeze. I was determined, you know, he would be a talking, um, reading little mite. <laughs> but he started school and we chose our local school because it was a friendly school, had a good vibe, good community. And um, I just put my trust in the school and mm. everyone says that, don't they? They say, just trust the teachers and just, you know, don't be the helicopter parent. So, yeah, yeah I... I did that. I let the school take over and um, it was disastrous. Mm. Um, the first son wasn't too bad. Like he did learn to read eventually, but he couldn't spell, still can't spell. And it was, sadly it wasn't until year 11 he was finally diagnosed with dysgraphia because mm. I was so caught up advocating for the second son who couldn't read at all and he thought frog started with W mm. and the school still told me that that was okay and I just needed to read to him more and perhaps yeah. I wasn't right reading him the right books even. Yeah. That was told to me by his grade three teacher. Mm. So you can see how, oh, man, it was so hard. And, mm. and that's um, a lot to take on because it sounds like the, you know, the blame was being put on you as a parent and the mm. things that you could do, which is, mm. you know, you believe it, don't you? When you're a parent, and there's a whole mm. lot of guilt associated with guilt that. Guilt and shame. You yeah. feel like you can't talk about it with anybody else. And I mm. think that's part of the problem for other parents. They don't want to um, talk about it and they keep it hidden. Um, yeah. And so I think that was the key for me was to saying, reaching out to other parents and saying, hey, we're, you're not alone. This is happening to us too. And yep. what can we do about it? Mm. And really started that difficult conversation with the school. Like, why have we got all these kids? who aren't reading, mm. what's going on. So how did that start? How did that first conversation start? Like, well, I suppose it was an evolution, but can you think of a moment when it was like, okay. I can remember because it was. <laughs> I'm going to do something about yeah, this. Yeah, <laughs> it was um, a friend who's a, a nurse and her son was in the same year as my little boy and they were both failing. And um, at the end of the year, we, I was asked in the playground actually, said, what are you going to do about your son? Are you going to repeat him? I'm like, what? <laughs> Where did this come from? Yeah. No one's had said anything to me all year, despite me saying, what can I do to help? What can we do? And um, my friend, his son had also failed. They really had to advocate hard for him to go on to grade one. Mm. Um, and that's really when it, we decided to do something together yep. um, along with that terrific man, Ophi Renner, who is a former principal, but he'd always wanted to be a teacher. And um, he got us together along with another parent, um, can I mention these people's names? Oh, yeah, yeah so sure. it was Kylie Fotheringham and Denise yes. Sawyer and Ophi Renner. And we formed a small little group at the school. I think it was called something silly like the gift of dyslexia or something <laughs> stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but it just got the conversation going and we worked worked out how we could help the school. Like I think that's the key is not to just go in with blame and anger mm. because nobody chooses to watch a child fail. Mm. Yeah. It's just they don't know any better and that's what really, um, once I researched it, you know, and really read everything I could and spoke to as many people as I could, I became aware that teachers aren't taught how to teach children to read and they would tell me that themselves. I actually haven't been, I don't know anything about dyslexia. I haven't been taught. Yeah. And so that was a real eye-opener to me um, as a GP because – um, we hadn't been taught about dyslexia as GPs. Mm. And so that's the problem, isn't it? Teachers aren't being taught and GPs aren't being taught and yet the diagnosis is medical and the intervention is generally educational. Yeah. Um, and so they fall through the big crack. Yeah. And, um, big. and we, we, were, we were, wow, <laughs> we were right in the firing line for failure. <laughs> I call it walking the plank because it was so obvious. We had speech delay. And had that poor phonological awareness, you know, thinking frog star with W mm -hmm. and um, just weren't family history. But And that's funny too. No one ever asked about the family history mm, of yeah. reading failure in the family. And I think that's such an important thing. It's always number one as a new patient, you know, what illnesses run in your family. Yeah. It's so important to get the background story of where the child's come from. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of how it started with our own 
personal school failure mm. um, and then it was, wow, do we move schools? And, well, there's no no point in moving schools because every school was the same at the time. Yeah. And this was only going back 10, 11 years. Mm. It's not that long ago. Mm. Similar timeline to myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's such a familiar story, isn't it? Yeah. Like I, yeah. Hear, I hear this story over and over again and it is usually the parent that needs to step up, isn't it? Yes. I mean, yeah. I, there probably are occasions where uh, teachers mm. mention it and maybe it's just, you know, the, the well, circle of some, people I move in. But There are some amazing schools now, yeah. but only a handful yeah. in South Australia. So... I was remiss not to mention, Sandra, that you're now the national president oh, yes. of Code Red. Chairperson. Chairperson, yeah. excuse Chairperson. me. It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, <laughs> Same word. very important and uh, pivotal. Um, but let's let's go mm. back. So, mm. Sandra, you you saw the difficulties with your own kids. Mm. You started to see that there were other parents in the same boat. Yes. And, and then I remember, so I remember getting a phone call from you. Mm. I still remember this as clear as it was yesterday in my living room. And I get this call from this Dr. Sandra Marshall. And how far along was that? Because you were building a group. Yes. I think that's probably a year or two into it. I'd been given your name by the principal of the school and it was very generous of her. And she gave me your phone number, but I didn't call you straight away because I just assumed you'd be another, um, uh, you know, you meet all these educators who talk the talk. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't walk the walk. And I just thought, oh, do your hands for it. It sounds like an old white middle-aged man, doesn't it? I'm like, <laughs> oh, sorry to generalise. So you're 100% on track there now so far. <laughs> <laughs> get my hopes up but yeah how wrong I was and how you shouldn't jump to conclusions and yeah because once I rang you it was just like oh like you know water on a during a hot day I was like wow he gets it he totally gets it and we we're on talking the same lingo and yeah and we started to get action and it was about networking, wasn't we? Went to the um, Robin Hood Hotel at Norwood. That's and right. Invited well, everybody yeah. along yeah. that we knew that might have an interest. Yeah. And, and it was a, a really interesting evening. Um, so, Sandra, you you had in mind, obviously, an idea to build something, right? Which has ended up, boy, has it ended up something. And when I... You know, it wasn't my idea. I was pushed into it by Ophi. He right. was 84. Four at the time, and he said, "I just wish I was forty years younger." And he says, "But you got it. You're going to do this, Sandra." I'm like, "Oh God, <laughs> I've never been on a committee. You know, I'm not really good with literacy and writing and agendas and all this stuff." But through Ophi, he got this little group of um, his. Uh, mates, I guess you'd say, mm. to help set up the constitution of our first not-for-profit, which was Dag Bags, which stands for Dyslexia Action Group. Gawler, <laughs> what's it? Barossa Surrounds. Gawler, thank, thank you. Yeah. I struggle with acronyms. And um, and that was so successful that and our goal then was to have all 45 schools in the Barossa and Gawler region dyslexia wear schools. Mm. So we were working with Neil Mackay. That's right. Yeah, we brought him out from Wales every year for several years and we um, got over 3,000 teachers to come and listen about dyslexia and how to make simple accommodations in the classroom mm. so that children wouldn't feel left out. It was just a magical mm. time really. It was. So there's a, so even back then there was a huge amount of interest in it yes. from teachers. I mean that's yes. interesting, isn't it? It yes. really shows that it's more just a lack of knowledge yes. than a lack of interest or a lack of desire to lack do something about it. Lack of opportunity to learn about it. Yeah, that it's amazing. Less than 5% of teacher courses apparently is, uh, is yeah. um, around literacy, let alone dyslexia, it'd be much, much Less, if at all. Mm. So, oh, gee. So, yeah, it's quite <laughs> disheartening because I only had an email today from a friend who's at a uni in South Australia and she was saying that the teachers don't even know what um, a phoneme is. Like, oh, mm. man. Well, no, I didn't. It's quite. No. Well, <laughs> I didn't do primary teaching but, you know, or English, but I was speaking to somebody only mm -hmm. a couple of months ago who's just finished their teaching course mm -hmm. and he said he had one lecture on dyslexia. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's upsetting. And I guess there's so many layers to that because even my son's who's just finished school, his friends who couldn't get the courses that they wanted to 
got went into teaching because mm-hmm. their ATAR was so low they couldn't get into anything else. And I think that's dreadful. And now they're working as SSOs and one of them was telling me he's working with his um, Aboriginal boy with autism, dyslexia, who's um, a foster child um, and he's working one-on-one with him to teach him to read. Mm. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know anything about reading? <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's heartbreaking. Mm. That's current. That's happening now. You think, wow, seriously? Mm. Yeah. Our kids deserve better and mm. that's – so, yeah, Dag Bags was set up and um, we achieved such success. We got lots of awards and accolades and um, but the people in Adelaide got a bit stroppy with us. Like, why aren't you making this state? Why are you just sticking with Gaul? I'm like, well, that's because we live. That's where we yeah. started. That's where we yeah, are. Yeah. <laughs> it's our community. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we felt, okay, all right then. We'll um, go up another notch. We created Dyslexia SA. Again, a new constitution, a new all the new branding. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is all, you know, as volunteers, it's really a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. A lot of meetings, carrying a, a lot of, um, I felt like the draft horse, you know, pulling the plow. Yeah. Pulling yep. all these tied principals and teachers along. And God bless them that they, they stuck it out, though. They did come along. There were so many amazing educators in the Barossa who, mm. Mm. who still stick by us. Yep. So, yeah, we created Dyslexia SA and we had. Um, the idea to have c- different communities around South Australia. So, you know, hoping for an Air Peninsula community, York Peninsula. We had... Um, Lower Mid North. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Chantal Dina's group. That's right. Um, and that was starting to take off and then um, through... Because when I started advocating, social media wasn't a thing. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And so it's completely changed the landscape now. Sure has. And I met all these amazing advocates online around Australia and it was decided that we really needed a national group in order to get real change at universities and mm-hmm. at government level. Mm. So um, I said, yeah, that all sounds very interesting. Good luck because I'm busy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then this um, very um, persuasive chap called David Peskard rang me up and he'd offered up the money to, to start it up and he said, um, you know, really twisting your arm here, Sandra, I want you to be the chairperson or I'm out sort of thing. Mm. Went, right. Oh. God. <laughs> so that's, well, that's a big vote of confidence. Oh, word it is. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a big, big deal. I re- have a lot of time for David and he's got a really amazing podcast with, um, what's the ABC chap? Um, Richard. Feidler. Feidler. Yeah, really great podcast. Listen to David Peskard's interview. Was that oh. on Conversations? Yeah, Conversations oh, okay. with We'll have to, put a link to find that. that. Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. So uh, that's about his school experience. It was dreadful. Mm. Um so anyway, that's kind of what happened and so I left Dyslexia SA and um, in capable hands with Janice McVale. Mm, very capable hands, yeah. And then, um, and then you know, starting up this new group and some of these people I hadn't even met. <laughs> that's what's so strange. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was, so it was a lot of trust but a lot of passion and it was a, quite a few trips to Melbourne and Sydney in order to get the branding right and the constitution and and um, set up the board. So it was a third not-for-profit in less than five years that I'd established. <laughs> <laughs> Do you look back over the last 10 years and go, boy, oh, boy, where did that go? Yeah, I just feel my life's such a rush all the time. Mm. It's so – because if I'm not at work and looking after family, then um, I'm advocating yeah. and it takes over. My husband won't let me use the word dyslexia in the house anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Used to be that I'd see people in the street and I'd see them almost crossing the road to avoid me because I, I guess I make, hold people accountable. You know, when mm. they see me, they feel guilty like, oh, gee, you know, I said I was going to do such and such and I haven't yet. Like, I didn't didn't mean it to be like that. I didn't mean it to affect friendships. Um, mm. But it has become my life. And um, So what does that look like as an advocate, as an active advocate? Mm. What does that mean day to day? What sort of stuff do you do? Um... At the moment, we're setting up, um, we've got a subcommittee trying to get a Medicare item number for a dyslexia assessment mm, and, wow. then, and then dyslexia intervention. So we've had a meeting with the Medicare guys and they said, yeah, there's no point having an assessment for dyslexia if you're not going to do an intervention. Right. So we're in the, in the um, journey of finding all the information that they require, which is really, it actually doesn't exist. Like there's no 
no research done to show the incidence of dyslexia in Australia and that's because mm. of the cost to get an assessment done and that that's always what's fired me up. It's just so unfair that only the rich kids get a diagnosis and the other yeah. kids are just left to fail. So yeah. now at my local high school they've got 40% of year nines that can't read and obviously they're not all dyslexic but yeah. they'd all be in that group, every yeah. dyslexic, and they feel terrible about themselves. Mm. So I'm going off tangent, aren't I? I'm very <laughs> no, good at that. <laughs> but, um, that's so it needs to be Australian data, does it? They, yes. Because, I mean, this has been Medicare done is Australian. all over the world, but they need to have an Australian Definitely. Percentage. Definitely. And then what mm. does um, what does six months intervention look like? You know, before you have an assessment, you need to have six months of intervention. Well, that mm. looks very different it in does. different yeah. circles, doesn't it? It What's certainly the evidence, does. You know, is six yeah. months intervention multi-lit or is it six months just good classroom teaching or is it, oh, and yeah. how do you guarantee the quality of the exactly. teacher that's delivering that exactly. intervention, even if it's a yes. even if it's so a program? Yes, they want all this information. Yeah. And then what does success look like? How many sessions do you need yeah. t- with a speech pathologist? So it has to be being Medicare. It needs to be health an allied health professional. So mm. we're looking to have, if we could, um, 20 sessions with a speechy with possibility of another 20 after mm. that. But where's the end point? Because yeah. yeah. often these kids never reach the end point, mm. the need ongoing intervention. Yes, well, that's right. So, yeah, that's one of the things we're working on and I've got a, other meetings with um, alliances, I guess, trying to um, network, mm. constantly networking. Mm. Oh, yes. Constantly looking to be relevant. So in March we've got a virtual run, which we'd love you to p- promote. Yeah, <laughs> yes. absolutely. So it doesn't need to be a run. It can be a hobble, <laughs> a crawl, <laughs> a swim, cycle, but... um. It's an annual event that costs $30 to enter. You can put a whole team in and that's a major fundraiser because mm. we are all volunteers um, and we've only just managed to hire somebody 15 hours a week to help us with our admin, which is a huge amount yeah, of work. Yeah. Yes. Um, Where can so people go to get involved with that, Sandra? Go to our Facebook page every day. There's a post about it or three times a week at the mm. moment or our web page, Code Red Dyslexia Network, is on the front page. Yep. And yep. Click on Register. And, of um, course, we'll put links to that in our will. show notes. Yes. Yeah. And then um, October is our Light It Red for Dyslexia where we light up things around Australia red. Um, and we used to have events as well. And we had a, a magnificent masquerade ball, didn't we? We did. <laughs> we sure did. <laughs> didn't see you there, Michael. You would have had a ball. It was... oh, and Liz, I, well, I was all dressed up. You just didn't recognise me. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because he had his high heels on. Wasn't it? <laughs> yes, that was you. That was you. Um, so anyway, yeah, I guess there's lots of day-to-day stuff. Checking with board members that they're going okay with their jobs because we have, you know, regular meetings and then it's following up the actions and mm. people get into trouble, you know, might have difficulty completing an action and that's my role to see how I can help and push it along. Mm. Um, mm. So it sounds like there's a – it's. There's multi-levels to this, isn't mm. there? There's mm. the level of a parent mm. who perhaps has just got a diagnosis or not even having an identification, just suspect mm. that their kids need some extra support. Then there's the level of, you know, talking at, with schools and, you know, education, that sort of stuff. And mm. then there's a higher level of talking to government, Medicare, that sort of thing. That's so right. it's really a huge job at all those levels. Mm. If we think now just about the parent level. Yes. Yeah. And think what sort of advice would you give to a parent who either suspects their kid needs extra help or, you know, has a diagnosis yeah. or perhaps like many of us is feeling frustrated mm. with their current situation in a school. Well, you have to start with the teacher, don't you? Yeah. It's just respectful to always start with the teacher, even if you think the teacher hasn't got a clue. You still have to just um, yeah. be polite and talk about what your concerns are and um, I always think it's so much better to um, use the carrot, not the stick. Yeah. And, you know, I might take a packet of biscuits in and have a chat with the teacher and, and see what you can work out together. If you don't get any joy there or you've still got concerns, then I'd go up to the learning support teacher and say, look, this is my concerns. And, for example, I was asking, why are you using this reading program? <laughs> 
Mm, yeah. <laughs> and I mm. was told because so and so's sister in law did the course. Yeah. And I thought, wow, yeah. that's so random. <laughs> this is just Russian roulette, isn't it? <laughs> and um, so then I went to the principal because that I wasn't satisfied with that answer. Mm. And um, and she agreed that that wasn't good enough. And so well, then we got spelled SA to come out to the school. And, and it was a team effort, though. And I looked for ways to, I could help rather than just being a, a whinger. Mm. Mm. So when you escalated it up, to the mm. principal, mm. how did you do it? Like, well, what? I made a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, wow. <laughs> took my laptop in <laughs> and talked about the forty-four percent of Australians that can't read. Mm. I talked about the twenty percent of Year Fours that can't read. I talked about the fifty thousand Year Sevens every year that can't read, and then we talked about how those people don't have the same opportunities in life. You don't get employment. You don't get housing. Your health is much worse. Um, much more likely to go, you know, into the juvenile justice uh, system, system etc. Mm. So it was, I got the emotion into it because yeah. my son was not reading at all. Yeah. And, you know, I could, I remember the guilt, I suppose, yeah. of the um, principal's face and um, that's, I think it really connected with her mm. and, um, and I made sure it wasn't, just about my child because... Yeah, that's what I was going to... Because it sounds like you came in and gave big. a big picture. you got to be yeah, big. Yeah. Rather you can't than be just, just me, my me, kid me. needs this. Correct. Yeah. I think, you know, that puts everybody off because mm. every... There must be so many... I mean, school's such a chaotic, stressful, busy place and mm. to be a principal must be one of the hardest jobs in the world. Yeah. And they get all sorts of things thrown at them like peanut allergies and... Well, yeah. Like COVID. Garden, or, <laughs> yes, yeah. COVID now. But it was nature play and yeah. languages and all sorts. And um, But I just wanted my son to be able to read. Mm. Spelling would be nice and writing, but read is paramount. Mm. Yes. And um, I think, yeah, making that quite clear and we w worked on it together, like how we could improve the reading instruction at the school. And that's when my little group, we started fundraising. So we sold hot dogs for dyslexia and we mm. had icy poles on hot days and we made burgers and sold them and all the money was used to buy decodable readers at the school because mm, that wow. was the first roadblock, like we can't afford it, we don't mm, have any money. Yeah. So we'll create the money. Mm. And it was just a small group of us. So if I'm a parent out there now listening to this mm. and thinking, okay, well, that sounds great, but mm. where do I get this information from? So you obviously have amazing research and fact-finding skills to be able to just go out and ask and we'll find, find, find this John information. Martins. Yeah, but, <laughs> but if I'm a parent and I don't know anyone that's an expert in this, mm. where can I go and, and get information that I can trust? We've made it so easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's all on our Code Red <laughs> Dyslexia webpage. So we've got a parent resource section and th things that you can use for you. For your own child with your own school, you can print them off or email them to your school, like um, classroom accommodation for a primary school child or classroom mm -hmm. accommodations for a secondary. And there's also sections for teachers, educators, um, individuals with dyslexia. But, yeah, it's all on our website and we've put all the Facebook groups on there too so you can find close Facebook groups where you can pop in there and ask questions and you get mm. answers. And it couldn't be easier. That's the... I must, we were talking about Facebook before and it's a bit bit over the top sometimes, but, gee, it's a brilliant tool for yeah. advocacy. Mm. It's like a big, no offence to dads, but it really is a big mother's yeah. group mm. meeting after hours yep. when the kids are in bed and you can get online and yes. ask a few questions and get answers. Mm -hmm. It um, is mostly mums, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, a few I know dads. that's been my experience. Yes. And, yeah. and when I have done my training, I've usually mm. been the only male Mm. In the yeah. room, or maybe one other. Yes, and uh, you know, it, but but even the kids that I tutor um, are usually quite pleased that they found a male because even yes. most of the tutors out there are female. Yeah, when um, I talk to groups of staff, Sandra, I um, is yeah, that on got, your lap? I got Gidget. <laughs> So, Bill's say, got a gorgeous so little, little tart, isn't poodle she? on his lap. <laughs> <laughs> Probably can smell my little poodle. Uh -huh. um, I, I tell teachers mm. that we're on the cusp of, I, I truly believe we're on the cusp of things changing. Yes. And I say that's 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 thanks to a bunch of angry mums 
in Australia, and I mention you by name, Dr. Sandra Marshall. Yeah. So a bunch of angry mums. I never used to be angry. <laughs> no. Well, Sandra, we'll talk about the fact that you never come across angry, right? Right. Uh, because I do want to talk to you a little bit more about well, your method. You're very humble, Sandra, but you I always said to you, you manage the slap and the soothe of this <laughs> so well. Because no teacher wants Someone to come in. Well, look, let's let's start. No one wants to hear about problems. Mm. And then no teacher is comfortable with a conversation about this system, the way you're teaching, Mm. is letting my kid and other kids down. Now, um, you've never worded it that way, Sandra, I know, but Mm. but we'll we'll get back to that. But, yes, it has been mums. It's Mm. It started, and I'd also tell teachers, I think South Australia was a very, very big part of this. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Sandra, so mm. tough conversations. You've had mm. them with with teachers, with principals, mm. with people above principals, regional directors, whatever name they go by, and politicians. Yes. Quite how, we've been in the office yes. of more than one edu- <laughs> more than one federal education minister. They come minister. and they go, don't they? <laughs> they do. <laughs> Sandra, I, you're very humble. I. I I've never seen someone manage these conversations as well as you do because mm. it is confronting information when someone says, you're not, we're not doing well enough. And you said right back at the beginning, getting angry never gets you anywhere. How on earth do you do this, Sandra? Because you're <laughs> phenomenal. I think um, you have to be humble and understand that there's um, every adult in a difficult job, be it you know, a politician, whatever, we've all got multiple demands made upon us. And um, being a GP, I'm, I, I find my job incredibly stressful and a lot of the time I feel like I'm making it up as I go. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it's having that respect for other people. It's mm. really important, isn't it? Like you don't mm. know how their day is going. You don't know what else is going on in their lives. Yeah. So you've got that little window of opportunity to make a human connection mm. and it's about advocating for the child. It's not about me or, or you or, or even you, Michael, oh. even though you got that beautiful moustache. <laughs> it's about the child who doesn't have a voice and, we, you know, that we're advocates for all the kids who mm. don't have a voice mm. and I just... You know, it's that vulnerability. I think we all have to be vulnerable. And once anger comes into it, you lose your audience. You yeah. lose mm. your um, sense of what's what are you there for. You yeah. know, everyone switches off with anger. Yeah. So you got to have a bit of a spark. You've got to have a bit of a laugh. Like I remember I took Simon Birmingham a packet of lolly snakes and said this because you've got all this snake oil in your school. <laughs> oh, I don't think I remember this. <laughs> and he was a bit worried about accepting a gift. <laughs> He wondered whether you were giving him poison snakes. No, he was worried he would get struck off because he's accepting a gift from a taxpayer. You're not declaring a bag of snakes. (laughs) So he made sure his reception staff ate them. I think he didn't touch them. But that's just, you know, having a bit of fun and, and thinking laterally. And I've always found when the going gets tough, and boy, there's been some tough times, Back off a bit, and I've I've learned that to surge and then relax. And often, when you relax, you come up with a whole new way of getting around an obstacle, which is often cleverer mm. and better rather than just more and more of the same. Yeah. You think laterally and think, how else can we get this message across? Surge and then relax. Yes. Mm. Did you make that up, or have you That's heard from that from Robert Close, Nick Champion's sidekick? Oh, well, the wonderful Robert, Robert Close and yes. the wonderful Nick Champion. Very wise words, and they've been with us all the time, yeah. the whole time. Yep. So yeah, I, I take that on board. Like when I'm feeling really stressed, right, go and do some gardening, or you know, mm. do some self care, and then come up with and talk to different people. Mm. And that's the other thing, Michael. Is really important to have your tribe. And I've yeah. found mm. my tribe. I've met. As hard as this advocacy is, and it takes up so much of my time and energy, I've met the most amazing people mm. and I wouldn't give that back for anything because mm. like the Bills, the Bartek's, all the all the advocates, there's so many in South Australia and now nationally mm. and they're my best friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> because we have this thing in common and that's about making a difference. Mm. And even my, my husband, who can be quite grumpy, said this is probably the most important thing we'll ever do in our lives. Oh, mm. yeah. And I think that's so true. He's quite wise, my husband. Mm. Like even though we do a lot of good stuff at work, it's advocating for the child, an innocent child, is 
what really matters to me. Mm. And, and to have that lifelong impact correct. for so many kids. The flow on effect mm. because it's intergenerational. And I've only learned recently that my own grandpa was a foster child and I wonder whether that is in my DNA that I um, really feel that sense of vulnerability mm. that the kids who really don't have the most vulnerable kids, aren't they? They really don't have a voice. Mm. And um, a lot of my patients are that that cohort of child and, mm, yeah. boy, they're vulnerable. Yeah. And, you know, that's where school, I know they often say, oh, it's up to the parents to do all the homework and get this child to school with mm. breakfast in their tummy ready for learning. But, you know, a lot of the kids are carers. Yeah. A lot of these kids have to work at Hungry Jack's to pay the bills for the family. Yep. They don't. Oh, you know, I might have this girl tell me this week she earns $130 at Coles and 100 has to go to her dad for food and she gets has to put um, petrol in her car with the other $30 and pay her car rego. Mm. And she, oh, she's, you know, you just feel for these kids. Yeah. She yeah. doesn't have anyone to back her. Yep. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, so where were we a, going with this? It's a really big why. Oh. So we were talking about... <laughs> How to approach a school, how yes. to approach a teacher at that, at that level. And I suppose the next thing up would be, say, the education department because you've worked at that level of approaching someone mm. in a department, working with, you know, the, the education department is huge and complex. Oh, yes. Do we mm. you know, and, and even <laughs> from within the department, sometimes difficult to Remember? work out how it works, yeah. <laughs> let alone we, find the right person to talk to. We had this amazing to. meeting with the... Uh, I can't remember the title, it was like the literacy leader. He was really surprised when a dyslexia group wanted to meet with her because she felt dyslexia was, should be under the disability. That's right, um, in its sector. box. And we're like, no, no, this is about reading. This is about the science of reading and mm. it was all new to her. It was only about five years ago, wasn't it, Bill? Yes. And, and we were shocked. We, we had a series of And that's at the meetings. top level. That's right, mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a, again, the Sandra Marshall secret source <laughs> of surge and relax. We met over a period, didn't we? Yes. With, yes. Yeah. Free COVID, so it was a monthly meeting or two meetings a term. Yeah. We'd rock up and meet with the department and mm. um, often we'd end up leaving in complete frustration. Yeah. But at least they listened yeah. and it has they, led to change. It, it certainly has. Um What's happening in well, there is a surge. To speaking of surges, there is a surge going on. I believe in mm. Department for Education, South Australia schools. There's this thing called the Literacy Guarantee Unit, which is mm. chock a block. Gold. It's just gold. Yes, mm. with really well trained, mm. passionate people. Some of them have been on this journey with us, Sandra, right, mm -hmm. right from the very beginning. They're our friends. That's right. Um, so South Australia, look, even though there is a heck of a road ahead, there is also a very long road behind us, um, yeah. a very successful road. Sandra, I just want to um, wind back a little bit about this stuff around uh, surge and relax and, and, and trying <laughs> to not, even though you might be white hot angry inside about yeah. this, I, I watch with dismay um, some of the feeds around the parent support groups around dyslexia and I see yep. some fairly awful teacher bashing going on and I don't every now and then I stick my toe in and what are your thoughts on that sort of thing? Oh, well, um, we get it too, GPs. I think there's so many keyboard warriors, isn't there? Mm. And, I, you know, I, when I see these posts on community pages about how useless GPs are, you yeah. just scroll on by, don't yeah. you? Don't, yeah. don't interact because... There's often, who knows, again, what's going on in their lives. Yeah, that's right. They're desperate people. And I know mm. how desperate I felt when my son was failing. I, mm. I, I would have walked on hot coals to help him because he, mm. he he was suicidal, right, mm. at age seven. And that, yeah. to me, that's shocking that a child starts school with such great hope and excitement with their packed lunchbox and off they go yeah. with their little uniform and they're sparkling their eyes. And but their tail up. <laughs> by the end of the year, the shoulders are slumped. Yeah. yeah. And the, 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 eye gazes downward and yep. the other kids are saying, what's wrong with you? How come you can't read? Are you stupid mm. or something? Mm. You know, I remember all that, the taunting. It really triggers me. Mm. Yeah. I think, mm. you know, I must have had something similar that I've blocked out. Mm. And it wasn't, you know, even, again, I'm going off track. It was about angry parents, wasn't it? Mm. I think for, as a parent, yeah, you have to be the adult. Don't become, you know, um, 
the person who just shoots your mouth off and you cause untold damage and you lose respect as soon as you do that. You need to develop a relationship. You've got to be an adult and put your cards on the table and ask the school to put their cards on the table and what they can help with and what they can't. And then, yeah, relax and find a solution together. Mm-hmm. How, sorry. Um, empathy, Sandra, is the word that keeps coming to me that you've got to ask yourself, you know, where's this person? What's their life? What yeah. demands do they have on them? And gee, I, you know what? I forget that. I feel, I feel like I'm sitting before a higher being sometimes, <laughs> Sandra. When you speak, um, well, we all forget it, don't we? Yeah. It's, mm. it's a tricky thing, and and maybe it is part of your day to day job. Some days to be just practicing showing, that. Yes, you know what I mean. Sometimes just showing up, it would be a hard job for some teachers. Some mm. days, I'm sure. Because, you know, they don't get to choose their, their pupils. Mm. And um, I know there's some kids around who would be so hard to, and challenging mm. to have in your classroom. And it, it would be, well, I know for a fact from, from myself, it's difficult as a teacher to separate yourself from that criticism. Because, mm. you know, most teachers are very passionate and kind of your self-worth is tied to your Yes. View of yourself on how good you are as a teacher. Yeah. So it's really hard if someone's coming in and saying, hey, you're doing a bad job. It's not just teachers. <laughs> it's everybody. You know, it's everybody. everybody. It's everyone yeah. who yeah. works. Yeah, we that's right. We all want to feel respected. Mm. And if you don't show respect, then you don't have an audience. You pack up and go home. Yeah. You yeah, know. that's right. Yeah. Be a nice person. Put yourself so, in other people's shoes, I wow think, we. too. Well, mm. what a life, what a, what a rule for living. Mm. So, all right, we were, before I... Um, Quite clunkily took us backwards. <laughs> we were t- we, what level were we at? We'd talked about schools. We were at that. We're talking about the department. That's right. And, oh, yes. And, you know, what really interests me is what are the blockages there? Because, you know, as someone like you, you know, you follow the science, you mm. look at the research and you go, it seems very clear Mm. what we should be doing. Mm. But when you go and meet with the policy makers or the people making the decisions, what are the roadblocks there? What are they? What oh. are the sort of counter arguments or the pushbacks that happen? Is it about? It, it's a bit it's like a strange. Trump, Trump experience. It's different. Mm. Um, different sciences, apparently, Michael. Mm, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that was how it was initially. Anyway, until we pushed through that layer of crap, mm. and um, I think we've come, as you say, the literacy guarantee unit, and where we. I don't know if this podcast is nationwide or whatever, but mm. it listens. Oh, it goes everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <it's> everywhere. <laughs> Even to Barbados. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's getting everybody on, to talk the same language and to have the, you've got to have that basic uh, understanding of how reading works before you can progress. So, so you think it is more of just the understanding of it or does oh, money so come into it? Or, no, it's mainly personalities. Oh, mainly personalities. So you okay. think of someone who spent their whole life promoting whole language yep. and then along come these upstarts called Bill and Sandra and mm-hmm. Bartek Code Red. And yeah. And, yeah. 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 <laughs> and always, and they, we say, no, that's wrong. Mm. And they, of course they're going to put their brakes on and, and put their head in the sand and, no, yep. I've only got three more years to retirement. I don't want all this. Mm. And that's kind of what's happened, hasn't it? But yeah. We've seen so many people get pushed out to pasture. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and how <laughs> do you face then, up to realising that what you've been doing for all those years hasn't been effective? Yes. I um, Gosh, I remember, again, I don't know if I can mention some terrible conversations that, <laughs> a Catholic, yeah, Catholic yeah. ed, where I was told by the literacy person not to mention the word um, reading recovery. We just weren't going to discuss it at all. Mm, now, and I'd yes. gone there specifically to ask for it to be removed from the schools in South Australia. Because, How long ago is this, Sandra? Just uh, probably six years ago. Yeah, yeah. Mm, sorry, keep yeah. going. Yeah, and um, you know, and sh- this person put their hands over their ears like a child and said, "We will not be discussing that." Mm. and sort of stamped her feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so wow. that was a good time for me to relax. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I must say, felt so low after that meeting, like, mm. wow, you know, we can't even have an adult conversation. Mm. Fortunately, you know, there's a new leader and um, we were hoping for change. It's a, not, not going as fast as we'd like. It's mm. a bottom-up change. Yeah, that's true. And I think that's the, it, oh, does it take longer? 
There's many people that will argue a bottom-up change is the best change. Yeah, you know? I agree. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. T- it's got to come from the teachers. But we need to get into the unis. That's yes. the problem. We yes. keep bringing out new teachers who they learn from their peers who still peddling whole language generally yeah. or balanced literacy. Yeah. And gosh, I left out these. Where are they? These. All these books. Don't they give you the horrors? These are my book of sight words that were given to my son and we had to remember all these words mm. and tick them. Remember them as visual units. Yeah, as yes. pictures. As pictures. And we yep. were yes. shamed because we mm. could never remember them. And I was given no clue on how to teach him. He just had to remember the whole word. Mm. I'm just reading Sandra's got the book open. It, then, he, had, they, with, of, their, got. And I it's just got a sight word. I well, it's completely phonetically written. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, said there was none of the, um, the teaching small rabbit. ants in danger. I was no. never told that little acronym. It was just like remember the whole word. Yeah. So this, I kept them because that, they were a miserable time of our life and um, we've come a long way but there's still pockets of greatness yeah. but large um, areas of mediocrity that we yes. need to influence so mm. that all kids and you know having grown in the country i'm aware that country people don't have choices of what school they go to you go to your local school yeah. and it's a small school and there might only be three teachers and you so you know often these are the kids who get told to leave school in year 10 mm. <laughs> go and work on the farm which mm. is nothing wrong with that no. but you should have the right to be literate that's a yeah. basic human right yes so i agree fight for. Mm. it should be a choice mm. Mm. so what uh, what is the long-term goal? So if you could wave your magic wand and have things how they should be, what would that look like? Um, well, I guess we have every teacher really confident mm. to know how to um, screen for reading difficulties, not just reading difficulties, math difficulties, mm. writing difficulties, any difficulty, screening, mm. even like we can make it bigger, autism. There's no screening. It's just random. Mm. You get so many, particularly girls who are like 15, 16, and they've been missed completely. Yeah. yeah. And by now they're you know stuck in their bedrooms, won't leave the home. They're so anxious. But screening and early intervention. Um, so we should have the phonics check nationally. So we mm. have 85% of the kids passing that. Sadly, in SA, it's still not required for schools to let their families know that their child's failed that year on phonics check. Mm. So, and mm. often no action is made upon the child failing that year on phonics check. So, I'm just appalled by that. So, people who don't necessarily understand what the phonics check is, mm. why is that important? That's checking your um, your understanding of the sounds and the words, and it's done after six terms of schooling. So, you've had enough time to be taught from your teacher. And then it's it's a 40-word um, check, five-minute check, and it picks up quickly which kids understand the sounds and which kids don't. Mm. So the pass rate was 26 out of 40. So, right. you know, I can say, you know, my nephew got 18 and his school didn't inform my sister. Mm. <laughs> and I think that's terrible. And why is it so controversial? I mean, it sounds logical. Dyslexia is this core phonological deficit or, you know, difficulty working with the sounds and words. So we say, mm. well, let's do a screener, mm. you know, when they've had enough school that they yep. should know this by now, let's screen them, isolate, you know, check out the kids that don't pass. Why is that so controversial? Yeah, a, Why has it been so hard? Yeah. Good question. And a lot of um, teachers who are, you know, who I guess they um, got that is it Diana Kruger effect where they think they know more than they do? Oh, they just say, Kruger, yeah, that one. Yeah. They go, oh, <laughs> I just know. You know, you just know. You can just tell which kids are struggling. But that's for the feedback about the U1 phonics check from SA teachers is they're shocked. Yes. They're shocked at kids that they thought would do really well who bombed out mm. and kids they thought would struggle knew at all. Right. So it's it's science. Yeah. And yes. that's what's so wonderful. And so we should have 85% of kids passing that and only 15% needing the Tier 2 and Tier 3 intervention. But currently we've got over 30% of kids needing intervention. Mm. And obviously this, it's hugely expensive. So if we can get, oh, gosh, you know, the year reception year one teachers bang on. To me that's the most important time yeah. yep. to grab them early. Yeah. And get all the um, medical services in schools because I saw the fences going up around schools and my heart sank. Like I know it's important for child safety, but we need medical services in schools. We need the speeches in the schools, the psychologists. Mm-hmm. 
That's right. So, yeah, I guess that's the other thing. And my bucket list would have psychologists doing assessments in the school yep. for free yep. through Medicare perhaps so that all children get assessed, any child who's struggling. So those kids who failed the phonics check, done their six months intervention mm. and still fail it, they need to be assessed mm -hmm. and it should be done automatically, yeah. not yep. depending on parent to find a psychologist who may or may not do a good assessment and often will charge $2,000. So it's mm, completely yeah. out of the yeah. ballpark for most families. And then what do you do with that report? Because, you know, that's, that's a big problem. Often you take the big report to school, and I know my report, my son said, do Orton Gillingham tutoring, and yeah. I didn't even know what that meant. Yeah. And it just got filed away. There's yeah. no Orton Gillingham back then yes. yeah. in where I live. Mm. One hour out of Gawler, I mean, mm. one hour out of Adelaide. It's, <laughs> it was a pipe dream. So I think, you know, we need the assessments to be done at school and the teachers to be involved very much in that assessment as well. Mm. Ideally, it'd be great, wouldn't it, one day we have teachers who can do the assessment themselves. Yes. But because it's part of the DSM-5, it's currently a medical diagnosis. Mm. So um, to be continued, oh, yes. <laughs> it's a journey, isn't it? So that's the aim. Teach kids well, assess them, and if they, you know... Catch them. Catch them, give them intervention... Normalise it. And do you think that's it? Like is that going to be? That's not going to be I enough. mean, that's it's, not going to be everything. Yeah. But it's going it, to be the start. That's the, what you're just, aiming for to yes. try and to, I think convince the, people to say this is what we need to do. Yeah, then we need the obviously the evidence-based mm. teaching and the programs to be. I think I know people don't like the word mandate, but I do think we need to mandate which programs should and shouldn't be used in schools because mm. I know teachers who just say, I wish they'd just tell me which programs to use. I've wasted so much money trying to work out which one to use and then the learning support teachers moved on to the next school and they're taking the passwords with them and they, mm. that, that program sits on the shelf dusty and it's a huge amount of wasted money. Yeah. So I would like to see, yeah, the government mandate which programs to be used and really teach teach as well. Mm. I mean, in the perfect world, you wouldn't need a program. You'd you'd teach. Yeah. Is it pedagogy? Is that the word? Is that a teacher yeah. word? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so are you aware of anywhere else in the world where this happens? No. Like does this actually function as a system somewhere else or are, or are others maybe a bit further ahead than us or further down that path? I don't think so either. Mm. I think there's pockets of greatness in, around the world, but mm. there's nothing that's national. Right. And um, So everyone's struggling with it. Yes. Mm. Yes. As far as I'm aware. I'd love to do a world tour with you guys. Yeah. Let's check it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should go to the Maldives. <laughs> I wonder what's going on there. Yeah. <laughs> so we kind of I, – I actually, I, there's something that popped into my head. Sandra – very early in knowing you, uh, and it was either you or Marie Gould, said something to me to the effect of, if this was going on in health, oh, yes. we would not get away It'd with be it. shut down. You can't just go on, I reckon, when you're <laughs> dealing with someone <laughs> who has disease, chronic disease. Trust me. Yeah, um, and, and that really stuck with me because um, just looking at Mark Seidenberg's book here, Mark Seidenberg says that uh, we educators are hugely ideologically driven and there's a lot of we, well, not his words, but there's a lot of we reckon in education and you just couldn't do that in health. No. Mm. No, and that's what I guess I found really difficult too that the, they don't seem to be flow charts and that's a big part of life in medicine you mm. follow a flow chart of yes or no <laughs> <laughs> i just learned gidget in the back door. poor little gidget. gidget's not quite sure how to get through the dog door <laughs> there we go good <laughs> and so oh, yeah. yeah um there doesn't seem to be any direction. And, again, you, there's no referral pathway because mm. I always thought, gosh, if a teacher doesn't know how to teach a certain child, surely they can pick up the phone and ask uh, a consultant. Mm. But there isn't that system, is there? You're on your own. And a year is a really long life. A year is a really long time in a child's life to be with a teacher who is um, not necessarily underperforming, but they might be, but unable to help that particular child. Mm. And so, yeah, I always think that's a big flaw in education that not drawing in 
other people's expert areas to enhance teaching. And I'm sure teaching is so much more interesting if you could see how other people teach mm -hmm. and and visit schools and, and yeah, learn from each other mm. more. Yeah, well, I suppose that's where the whole push for accountability is coming from, you know, trying to make teachers accountable. And then, I mean, I don't know a lot about it, but I suppose that is partly what NAT plans there to try and do, to try and do a standardised test and it say... It tells you the problem but it doesn't tell you the solution. Where yeah. are we at? And that's yeah. where the Literacy Guarantee Unit has been terrific, but I understand you have to be really quite a struggling school in order to have a, a literacy coach mm. Um, mm. granted to your school. So mm. there should be a system where you can ring up for information mm. from that coach. Um, what a great idea. To say, hey, you know, this kid's mm. having trouble with chit and shit and what can I do, yeah. and, uh, for example. But, yeah. It, that's a very common problem with big systems, isn't it? Things have to be dire mm. before that sort of help is offered. It's the old story of ambulances. At the, at I don't the even of the know cliff. dire. I mean, things are so dire, but it's because yeah. they're kids and kids don't vote. Yeah. That the, it just continues. They have no power. Well said. Mm. And mm. that's why we need to be their voice. Mm. Yes. As adults, be adults and protect them, guide them, be their shepherds. Mm. It, it is a system that waits for failure, isn't it? Oh, sadly, sadly, because if you wait for failure, then yes, you may intervene and help the kid read, but the psychological damage is already done. It's done. Mm -hmm. You know, the failure state, which is devastating yeah. for everyone. You know, oh, we've yeah. talked about that shame and that yeah. lifelong impact. It's almost PTSD that many yeah. people have from their school experience. Yeah. And, it's, and, you know, if we use the medical model, it's almost like waiting until someone is so sick they can't Terminal. get out of bed mm. <laughs> before you actually, you know, as a GP, talk to them. It's like <laughs> ramp, it's no, ramping. no, you're not sick enough, you're not sick enough. Mm. It, it's really, I, I think it's, I kind of see it as a form of discrimination as well because, mm. Definitely. you know, even the way the um, SACE special provisions works, because I had this conversation with someone from SACE at an information evening, they work on how much the kid needs the support. Functional so, impairment. Yeah, so mm. to get it, you have to prove that you have needed this level of support for a period of time. Mm. But let's say I live with dyslexia, but I work so hard that yep. I succeed. Well, then, because I'm working so hard, I don't get the support. Yep. But... So it's not a living pl level playing field no. unless you're failing. No, like right. unless yeah. I'm actually falling behind, I don't get the support. If I, you know, like people I know, work so, so hard to, you know, maintain my status and mostly I would do that for my own mental health, mm. <laughs> you know, mm. so I don't feel foolish, then you're not rewarded for that. No. You're... But gee, it's improved so much because when we started um, advocating, it was complete bottleneck. SACE would disregard any dyslexia assessment and say, it doesn't matter about that. You just need to be able to participate. We don't care about how well you do. Mm -hmm. It's just about, right. you know, entering the race. Yes. And we went in with barristers and <laughs> advocates <laughs> and amazing Annette Brock and Karen Hodson mm. and fought so that kids who don't have an assessment won't get hard done by and that's part probably why that's come about michael mm. is so that kids who haven't had an assessment but they always need extra time they always need a scribe will automatically get that for their sace mm. which and, is brilliant yes My and word. that's hasn't yeah. happened interstate it's terrible interstate often you need to have another assessment to prove you're still dyslexic mm. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. It, it's just it magically one day disappears yeah. and mm. who can afford that you know and it's having what you're saying to the child you have to prove that you're disabled Yes. Again yeah. and again. And how does that make you feel? Mm. Awful. Shame. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, we shouldn't be um, putting our kids through, through that. It's so traumatic. So I do like the um, the spirit of SACE, which is yes. saying if you need accommodations, normally that will automatically happen. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, I wasn't trying to be critical. Yeah. I was just trying to point out that whole failure-based system. You yes. know what I mean? It is that kind of emergency yeah. yeah, you know, I think it's when hard it to reaches be... emergency point, then something happens. Yeah, but am I right in thinking that this phonics check that you're talking about would try and stop that? 
or be a way yeah. to stop that weight to failure because you catch them before when six, it gets to that point. When yes. they're six, for goodness sakes, yeah, not 15. Mm. Yeah, the phonics mm. check has been revolutionary, I believe, anyway, yeah. because it has been the impetus for teaching and the way we teach reading to change mm. because all of a sudden there was this measure, this highly mm. evidence-based measure that said this kid's in trouble where, like Sandra said, the kids that were in trouble weren't being spotted. Mm. These kids would usually only show up at Year 5 NAPLAN or what they famously call the Year 4 slump yep. yeah. where all of a sudden these kids run out of um, storage capacity for that inefficient way they were storing words, mm. basically visually, because yeah. they had poor phon phonological awareness which made phonics not stick. So, I mean, we've got to say hats off to South Australia. You know, I know mm. we're South Australian. I'm not, I'm not a highly parochial person but that's been one of our big, big wins, Sandra, and you have mm. been right there in the front mm. seat. <laughs> Is <laughs> <laughs> the union wasn't very happy with me, and that's no. something I had to learn. Is that the union is there to advocate for teachers, mm. and they told me quite categorically that we don't care about the kids. That's not our job. Mm. And so we're fighting experience. against the union in order to get what's right for the kids. And so explain to me, because I don't quite understand why this is bad for teachers. Well, they seem to think it was more work for teachers because mm. um, poor old South Australia we had to do the running records up until. This year, yeah, that, that was mandated, and that was ironic because we kept being told by the department that we can't mandate anything, and yet they mandated running records, yeah. mm -hmm. which is just foolhardy. So that's finally been dropped, and now teachers can f focus on evidence-based screening and intervention without being hampered by those highly wasteful, time-inefficient running records. Mm -hmm. And also damaging because they reinforced a yeah. very flawed yeah. Oh, way of that's still reading. schizophrenic mm. being teacher. You get told to do it this way and then you get told to do it that way. And There's a bit of whiplash involved, uh, isn't there, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not that hard. Yeah, yeah. And I've learned that it's a system and, you, again, you can't pick on an individual teacher because they're part of a big system. And that's right. We were taught early on that moving that system is akin to pulling a cruise ship with dental floss between your teeth <laughs> and it has felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> Our jaw is aching. <laughs> so it's about fighting for the teachers as, as much as anything. Mm. So... We've been talking pretty much exclusively about dyslexia, haven't we? Mm. But putting on a slightly different hat, there are kids who live with dyscalculia, mm. difficulty with maths, yep. dysgraphia, ADHD. Yes. And I, I think particularly, you know, probably just from my personal experience, a disability with maths can be or is just as damaging. Yes, you know, psychologically to a kid as dyslexia. But we don't really hear about it, which kind of puts it like dyslexia. You know, back when you mm. was when you started and you said no mm. one had ever heard of it, you'd yep. never heard of dyslexia. Do you believe in it? Yeah. I was asked. Yeah. Wow. I kind of think um, <laughs> dyscalculia. Mm. Well, even is, less is known about dyscalculia. Yeah, that's right. And mm. dysgraphia. Mm. And um, so, so it's kind of a two-part question. Does Code Red have resources and information about dysgraphia and dyscalculia. Yes, yes. And even though it is about dyslexia, um, do you do work for kids, you know, adv advocacy for kids? With the other with, Ds. With, other, with the other Ds. I can't say we make that a big focus because we'd be spread too thin mm. as a group of eight volunteers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we're well aware that it's done very poorly because less is known about it and the intervention needs to be with educators and, again, that becomes a private battleground. And I think there's only one, like, known tutor or two in Adelaide, mm. isn't there, in South Australia? So there's where not do you, many. People ask where do we go for yeah. help with dyscalculia and, mm. well, even you have to find out who does the assessment. Mm, so, again, yeah. you have to research who does the assessment. Same with dysgraphia. Who does the assessment? Because some OTs won't, won't diagnose, some psychologists won't diagnose. It's a minefield. Mm. Yes, it depends on which psych ed psychs have which tests and how yep. well they use them. So, mm. yeah, my mm. poor lad had his... Um, Psych assessment age eight, I think, and we suffered through several years of tutoring. It was miserable, really mm. miserable. And then um, he just kept underachieving at school and I asked the teacher so many times, you know, nicely whether they think he has dysgraphia. 
and was always told no, no. And, you know, eventually year 11 it came to a head and we got him assessed with by an OT, even though he'd had OT earlier, that OT doesn't diagnose, but mm. this other OT did. <laughs> yeah. And it was life-changing for him to get that. He calls it ha- um, handwriting dyslexia because mm. yeah. that's how it is for him. Mm. Yeah. And I just can't believe that people didn't talk up, speak up about it because he would only have managed a small amount of writing in the period of time compared to his peers who would have, you know, in comparison done a couple of pages. Yeah. Mm. And even now, you know, his writing's illegible, as is yeah. my husband's, and that, again, goes back to family history. Mm. Um, you've got to ask these questions and be curious. I think that's the other other thing. Like I do think educators need more to be more curious and if you don't know, ask, mm. yeah. find out. And this, you know, with the internet yeah. now, mm. there's no reason you can't. And all these webinars are amazing. That's the silver lining of COVID, mm. isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. The information's there. Yeah. And a level of brave, bravery there. Like, like you said, if there was somebody, I mean, I yeah. actually love the idea of a helpline like yeah. a hotline mm. yes. where you can call and talk to an yes. expert and say, where do I hey, go? look, here's my situation, you know, am I reading too much into it or could this kid, you know, benefit from a yes. an assessment? And you can have someone who's so experienced. So is say, sort of in that position, mm. but Spilled's not in every state or territory in Australia. Mm. But, yeah, and, and so SA, they're a great sounding board my word. for schools. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't realise that was a resource. That's well, spelled offered. So you can call spelled. I don't know if you're whether a it's parent. free. As yeah. a parent, yeah. you can ring up for information though, and you can make an appointment, yeah. which do you have to pay for. But yeah. you can start off by looking at their mm. website or Code mm. Red's website and there's so much information free. Mm. But, and um, then as a teacher. But as teachers, yeah, they do. Calling what, spelled? They do. Well, I, they get lots of phone calls from teachers, mm. I believe. They do. Mm. And they run courses for teachers, so yeah, right. it, they'd steer you in the right direction. Sandy Russ is amazing; she, absolutely yeah, she's wonderful. She's very generous with her time. And I neglected to mention Sandy's name in that list of people before. <laughs> Sandy, but yeah, well, that's Bill, it. It's been a collaborative just, effort, yeah. and I think that's mm. the other key we haven't brought up highly enough is that it's a collaboration with um, Five from Five, Jennifer oh, Buckingham, wonderful Jennifer Buckingham, um, yeah. Lorraine Hammond, oh, yes. the books over there, yes, um, from Learning Difficulties Australia. Mm. And Mandy Nate and Oz spelled, and then our local Sandy Russo spelled. Um, and, you know, now I'm working with Speech Pathology Australia and the Psychological Society of Australia. So it's about yeah. reaching out to all the um, people who have got this in their in their heart. Yes. Mm. And so many people do. We're all from diverse backgrounds. It's collaborating. Mm. And it's going somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you know what I mean? It's yeah. slow and we get frustrated, but things have really changed a lot. Yes. And I always think you there's can been start, great success. You can just do small changes, you know, just a little thing in the classroom would be not to have the reading um well, no level, level readers, remove the leveled readers and, yeah, maybe fundraise at your school to get decodable readers if you need to, but not have the reading league thing on the wall where the kids who are great readers get all the rewards. <laughs> yes, not, <laughs> yes, that's right. The, the, take that away. The on the wall, yeah, not, not to be confused with the reading league in the US mm-hmm. who do wonderful work, but the chart of who's at what level yeah. in the wall. Yeah. And the pen licence. Yeah, pen. remove the pen licence, that's right. <laughs> and don't hold up the perfect, you know, book with perfect writing and perfect colouring in as this is what we're all aiming for because yes. it's not achievable for a lot of children. It's unrealistic expectations and people give up if the if it's too hard. Yes. So, uh, and please, please, if uh, a student is struggling to read, don't ask their parent if they read to them when they mm. were young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the one of the huge furfies of this, you know, mm. if you're struggling to read, you just weren't read to enough. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yes, That's right. I've certainly got that. Yes. Well, where are we, Michael? And have we hit? Have we hit our um, the sweet spot? I reckon we have. I think we have. <laughs> um, Dr. Sandra Marshall, Chair of Code Red, spelt R E A D. You're very good, There's, Bill. Yes, I need to get that right. Um, it's a play on words, isn't it? It red. is. It's, it's because very it's clever. a emergency, and red is it red or read? You don't know unless you explicitly. I can't say that properly. Explicitly. <laughs> Um, taught, which is what we want at schools to be, you mm. know, to use explicit teaching. Mm. Sandra, um, thank you for your time, but not just today. You have been instrumental 
in this country and I probably would say abroad as well, you have moved mountains <laughs> and you have shifted in no indirect way what is going on in classrooms right now. Uh, you and the group that you have built through your wonderful mm. empathy and people skills and incredible ability to bring people on with you. So thanks for having us. Um, it's been an honour. Thanks for amplifying my voice. Our and, pleasure. Um, thanks so much for your um, support forever, Bill. And I'm so sorry it took a couple of years to pick up the phone to ring you. <laughs> oh, you! <laughs> it's been a it's been a pleasure, and it will continue to be a pleasure, Sandra. Thank you. Thanks, guys. If you want to find out more about Code Red and the fantastic work they do, then visit coderednetwork.org. If you want to contribute to their work, you can join in on their annual Equal Right to Read virtual run or Light at Red for Dyslexia in October. We hope you got as much out of this episode as we did. You can visit discastia.com for all the notes and links we mentioned in this episode. You can subscribe to be notified when we publish new episodes. You can leave a comment or you can start a conversation with Bill or myself on social media. 